morning, everyone, and thanks for coming to the third and final research seminar, graduate research, PhD research seminar from the year And the title is Women for Losing Ground, Women and 21st Century Socialism in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Thank you, Jan. So I want to thank everyone for coming today on such short notice. So short notice. Also to Dr. Peel, who is Skyping all the way from London. Thank you for doing this. Um, also, sorry. Also, thank you to Professor Maddock and Professor Gilbert for their continued support. Um, this being my third and final research seminar, I wanted to um, basically present my conclusions. To present my conclusions um, since I'm uh, doing my fieldwork and other, other research. Um, the way I conceptualized my conclusions were through, I guess you have to background. Yeah, the way I conceptualized my conclusions or my conclusion chapter was through a set of reflections as well as new theoretical considerations or theoretical or conceptual um, frameworks that I did not initially think about when I went into the research. So stuff that came up while conducting my fieldwork, um, do not literature reviews, etc. Um, so I wanted it to be sort of, um, as I said, a reflection. And in a document that I sent to Dr. Pia, Professor Gubin, and um, Dr. Reddup, um, it sort of reads sort of like a travel log, <laughs> sort of, um, you know, travel log slash new theoretical considerations. And after speaking to um, Dr. Um, Professor Gubin this week, I believe I'm going to take out some of that travel log ish <laughs> information and just make it more of, you know, these new theoretical and conceptual considerations of, you know, that I um, first, of all, first of all, I want to say it's been seven years since um, Chavez has sort of unveiled his socialist programs, 21st century socialism, having been elected in 1999. It was only five years later that he sort of unveiled, unveiled this 21st century socialism, the Bolivarian Revolution. So when he, when he got into power, it was not something that he brought to the people right away, right? six years later. And even today, 21st century socialism is something that is still a work in progress. There are definitions, but there's nothing, it's still not concrete. It's something that's still being worked out by President Chavez's administration. And it's something that is being worked through by the people, which I think is very, very important. Something that is working through by the people. And it's more than just an, an, an ideology, because if you look at it, Ideology, sorry, if you look at it, you could probably base it on Marxist thought, Leninist, Trotsky, um, Simon Bolivar thought, etc. Um, but it's more than just an ideology. It's about what matters to the people. And I think that's what makes it different than, let's say, socialist programs of the past. Can I have a link? I call in earlier and Reflections and new theoretical considerations. Um, one of the first um, <coughs> going into to, um, to Venezuela and speaking to feminists, feminists in, in Caracas, um, these women who were very instrumental in the formation of the feminist movement, especially um, between the 70s to the 1990s. Um, the first question I had was, well, you know, well, what sort of feminist do they ascribe to? And from what I saw, many um, describe themselves as being radical feminists especially um, Dr. Adesia Castillo, who I drew on heavily on my last seminar, who, you know, she would, she would be considered radical because, you know, she is against Chavez as a man calling himself a feminist, so there's a sort of radical thought. And if you look at the history from this movement here, it's just, they ascribe this sort of like a liberal feminism in their, um, you know, in their, in, in their fight around discourse, um, around legislation and women's rights. But I think looking at um, looking at Venezuela in this context, there's sort of a, a deconstruction of feminism as we know it, and I think it calls for new readings on feminism. So this is why well, what I've found here are new feminisms. First one is popular feminism, as described <coughs> by Rakowski and Espino. 
who are, they are Venezuelans, and a lot of my work draw from them, especially on this, because they are like the, the main persons who are writing on this in Venezuela. And I really want to draw from Venezuelans, Venezuelan feminists. Right? So one of, the, one of the feminisms to have developed from 21st century socialism is what Grokowski and Espina has termed popular feminism. directly tied to the creation and the work of INOMIHER, which is the Instituto Nacional de Mujer, which is the National Women's Institute. Right? And it's backed by such slogans such as true socialism, true socialism is feminist, or sin feminismo, no hay socialism, socialism, sorry, that should be socialism. Without feminism, there's no socialism. Um, this popular fem feminism has thus evolved into sort of a state feminism. And um, Maria Leon, she is the president of the Nova Hair, she has stated that such a movement would emphasize both the class and gender issues of poor women as the basis for women's struggle within the revolution. So now we see the um, feminism moving from, so, from sort of uh, upper to middle class movement to more of a poor <coughs> working class movement. Um, Rakowski and Espina has also um, noticed the discourse around popular feminism would move from, in order to defeat capitalism, patriarchy and women's oppression also need to be defeated. To one of to defeat women's oppression, capitalism must also be defeated. And that's important, and I'll get back to that at the end of this, um, this section. Um, another type of feminism to evolve from 21st century socialism is what Rokos and Espino also term as opposition feminism. And um, basically the women who sort of categorize this sort of feminism um, they, are, they are in opposition to President Chavez and 21st century, century socialism. And they propose to rescue the women's right to gender from radical feminists and the state by opposing, for <coughs> example, abortion and quotas. Um, it's important to know that abortion is still decriminalized in, in Venezuela and with regard to quotas. Um, <laughs> Opposition feminists, they describe themselves as oppos opposition feminists and they use the feminist, um, what did I say, feminist phrasing, wording. I guess in Venezuela there's a lot of rhetoric, like a lot of words are used. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of words are thrown idea. around. So are they, when we, you know, through Western or Western perspective, consider them feminists? No, but they, they are feminists and they are opposition feminists. And they're against President Chavez and what they consider radical feminism and state feminism or popular um, feminism, as exposed by um, Chavez and Hitler. Also, there's what I call feminism based on red needs. And this is um, really from my field work where I spoke to women who consider themselves feminists. I'm a feminist. And these are women with no sort of um, ideological underpinning of <coughs> feminism, right? No sort of theoretical background backing. But they believe they are feminist, number one, from the popular feminism as sort of, um, as far as I capitalized, you know, by the state and Chavez and Kino Meher and Maria Leon, right? So because, you know, there's this popular feminism which is sort of categorized or um, linked to the the revolution, right? And because they support the revolution, it means that they are feminists. <coughs> Why they're also feminist? I would get answers like, well, now I can eat, right? Now my family, we could go get food at the supermarket. I'm feminist because I could get glasses, I glasses. I'm feminist, you know, I, I could get water. I'm feminist because I have a, a home, I have shelter. And this is, to them, that is feminism. In this way, feminism has multiple meanings. And especially in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and in its context, um, it depends on what matters to you and having your needs or interests met. As I said, it, it is without any sort of feminist, you know, theoretical underpinning, but they are feminists and you can't tell them. And speaking to them, you can't tell them they are feminists. They are feminists.
in looking at these new types of feminism, right, it, it pertains to dominant ideological construction of feminism. One, the basis of women's oppression as capitalism, and two, the basis of women's oppression as patriarchy. And this is where there is sort of a split between each of these new feminisms that I've mentioned, and also within um, those women who consider themselves feminists, who have, who have been in the movement from the get-go, to the sort of new popular feminism as espoused to by the state. So this is where there's sort of a, a breaking, right? Is women's oppression capitalism, or is it patriarchy? This is where there are many differences. Is there one answer in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela in this context? It's sort of unresolved. <laughs> or maybe you guys have the answer. You'll tell me after. Shall we break the report? As I realized in my research, um, many of the questions that I have, the answers are sort of unresolved, as there is a lot of, it's, like a, it's a big paradox. As I, I see Venezuela as a place of many contrasts. And I, I've, I've seen it um, as such in my Facebook as well. Bodies and power. This is something I did not um, think of when I first went to, um, to do this research. But while there, I realized that there was some sort of construction of bodies, of women's bodies, in, in Venezuela. And such, and such a construction being done by Chavez, by Chavez himself. And I thought, um, and of course, um, this statement was very true. The state seeks its strength in the quality of the population, the quality of the body. So what became important to me is how does Chavez construct the body in the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela, especially women's bodies. Since women are the face of the revolution, women, their bodies are the face. If you drive from, for example, you drive from the airport to Caracas. You're sort of bombarded by posters and drawings and paintings. And especially where there's sort of like this advertising of state of state feminism, popular femi um, feminism. You see women, women's bodies. So I wanted to see, I was interested to find out how the bodies are constructed, how bodies are constructed in this way. So uh, my main question was, is the docile female body in the Foucauldian sense and empowered female body in the Chavezian sense? <coughs> One, is it the same body? So I had to um, go back to, in looking at the body, to me you have to, you must look at Foucault and his concept of the body and, and power and biopolitics. Right? And Foucault states that the body becomes a useful force even if, only if it's both a productive, a productive body and a subjugated body or a subjective body. So um, this is why my question uh, obtains. My second question is, is the empowering of the female body in the Chavezian sense a means by which physical life is sustained? Or is this empowerment, is it something long lasting for women? In this way, I had to sort of look at the of the, the theoretical frameworks around bodies. So let's not to go into uh, a few of them. So for example, Laura in 2007 states that the body becomes a social body due to the intersection of race, class, sexuality, and gender. Bodies are also gender that, and as a gendered body, as a gender social body, sorry, the body is not a shape by societal norms and values. And so different experiences of the body produces different senses of self. Thus, for example, the female of lower caste, for example, the lower caste female Venezuelan body will produce a different sense of sense of self or subjectivity than that of the upper class female or male Venezuelan body. Socially produced bodies are thus shaped by socio-cultural ideas, and I would posit that in the current Venezuelan context, they are also being shaped by political ideas as well. It is it, it is in this shaping, it is this shaping, sorry, which acts to <coughs> normalize bodies and regulate them through the production of certain identities. This is what I see happening in Venezuela. For Foucault, the body is also directly involved in a political field. For relations of immediate hold upon it, the investor forced it, forced it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs. The body's 
economic and political use, however, can only occur when it is invested with relations of power and domination, and thus caught up in a system of subjection. So in this way, exploring who was of power is important, and for Foucault, sorry, for Foucault, power is not possessed, but is exercised, it is productive and not oppressive, and is analyzed as from the bottom up and not from the top, top up. As such, with power being exercised and being productive, Foucault gives accounts on how certain institutional cultural practices have produced individuals. As such, so we get to 2000 describes disciplinary power, which is what um, discipl disciplinary power, sorry, is uh, the acts which sort of um, makes bodies, um, productive bodies. Describes disciplinary power as, as such, it increases the power of individuals and at the same time it renders them more do so. But to go back to the most important part here, cultural practices which have produced individuals. I see that extremely important in the Venezuelan context. Um, for example, when I visited a, a shelter, well, they called it a, a refugee camp. I was very confused about the kind of refugee camp because I didn't understand that you would have refugees. But what they, because of my understanding of the word refugee, but they mean people who are displaced from their communities. I visited a refugee camp in Maria State. Called, this camp was called the Valle. And one of the rules every morning is that everyone must gather and sing the national anthem and the hymn of the of Chavez political party. That's a rule. And I believe like it, it's in, it, it, it is in practices like, like those. That's just one example that Chavez is sort of constructing these bodies in, as a means of, so of meeting the goals of the state and possibly even sustaining his political life because it, it sort of is linked to political support. I also see him creating healthy bodies. For example, there are two missions that he has created, uh, Mission Mercal and Mission Barrio Adentro. M Mission Mercal um, is basically a group of, a set of supermarkets, government owned and sponsored supermarkets which offer low cost food to the poorer classes. So for example, women I spoke to, you know, they, they would say, well now my family, we could buy food. We could have healthy meals, right? Food equals, I guess, eating. Eating equals healthy body. So he's producing so, you know, healthy bodies in this way. Um, Ms. Jean Barrio Dentro offers um, low cost and free, mainly free health care to the population. And many people who cannot afford health care before to, to clinics. And I mean, these aren't just, um, you know, building with a doctor. <laughs> I'm talking about state of the art, the state of the art equipment, etc. And many of these clinics are, are in the barriers. So the people, the women, especially who have lived in the barriers, who have been rendered invisible, especially in past administrations. Now, there's some, some sort of, um, they see themselves as visible to, to Chavez, to the powers that be because of you know, access to, to health care. And in this way, the healthy body is a productive body, right? A productive body is a body during elections time to go vote for Chavez. Um, in another instance, um, I just read for, for Foucault, this empowered female body the Shabidian census of those are bodies. The body which has been constructed, regulated, and improved. And that's what I've, I've seen happening in Venezuela with regard to women's bodies. However, there lies a paradox with regard to the Shabidian concept of the body and the way that Chavez has constructed as such. Because Chavez has been very vocal, especially with regard to plastic surgery, women and plastic surgery, especially breast augmentation. And he has publicly gone out and, and denounced it. Right. And he says, you know, he has recommended doctors who convince some women that if they don't have big bosoms, they should feel bad. That's a quote from him. Um, for Foucault, and this has caused a lot of, um, well, not a lot, I think at the time when he said it, and he said it in last year actually, there was sort of a buzz around it where, for example, the um, one of the main newspapers, Il Nacional, came out and spoke, spoke out against it. Um, and wanted to know, basically um, stated that that statement was sort of a repressive one. 
because he was basically directing open, you know, on what to do with your bodies. So in conclusion to this um, section, um, I would say that the docile female body in the, in the Foucauldian sense is the empowered body in the Chavezian sense. It's docile because it's constructed, it's regulated, it's improved, and it is productive and empowered in the Chavezian sense. Because um, women, you know, now their, need, their, their needs and interests are met. And this, this translates to sustained political life. And more, more power to Chavez and the, you know, him meeting the goals of the Bavarian revolution. Next, um, the nation state, national identity, and nationalism. This again was something I did not go into this research thinking about. And I believe that Chavez, through his combination of Marxist thought, Leninist thought, you know, Trotsky, um, inspired by Bolivarian thought, and also the socioeconomic and political set of people, have sort of um, reconfigured and sort of constructed the meaning of the nation, national identity, and nationalism. I think what, what it meant to be Venezuelan pre to be a Venezuelan pre nineteen ninety eight is different than what it is to me to be Venezuelan to be a Venezuelan now or to identify as Venezuelan. And one of the first things that Chavez did uh, upon his election with regard to um, constitutional reform is to change the name of the country from Venezuela to the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela. <clears throat> so in this way, um, I especially like to use Davis and and Pierce's definition when it comes to nationalism and nation building, right? This means a um, production of cultural offspring who know who they are and are participants in national struggles and symbols of national identities, right, which are produced. As such, nationalism, which is now reproduced, articulates a communal loyalty and recognizes a shared identity. And this is exactly what I have seen um, in my fieldwork and in my visits to um, to Venezuela. <clears throat> of course, I needed to get a definition of nation state because um, what I've realized in my reading is that there are some who sort of see a difference between nation and state from the joint them. And I really wanted one, I wanted a nation state um, definition. And I used Robinson 2004, a system where there's a historically specific correspondence between production, social classes, and ter territoriality. <clears throat> I also, um, I think, um, Corrigan and Sayo, what they had to say was also important. Modern relations of rule and forms of discipline construct and are constructed in everyday practices. For example, what happens at that refugee camp in El Valle, the refugee camp which is near El Valle in Marido. And that's not a rule for that refugee camp alone, that's a rule for all of these so called refugee camps. So it's sort of, sort of like these everyday practices. Every day we get up, we sing the anthem, we sing the anthem of the national party. As such, state formation is cultural formation, which I see very much prevalent in Venezuela. And everyday state routines, rituals, activities, and policies, which are themselves material, cultural forms, constitute and regulate the social meaning of movements and of subjects. And again, I would go back to when you first land in Venezuela and you drive from the airport to Caracas and just being bombarded by posters, billboards, um, paintings, you name it. Um, you know, ad really sort of advertising the, I mean, it's the PR, really advertising the social revolution and Chavez. And also, besides that, um, Looking at the history of Venezuela and Latin America, so you would you would definitely see um, billboards, paintings, posting um, pictures, especially of, for example, um, Simon Bolivar, Simon Rodriguez, and these sort of Latin American heroes, and sort of you know stating the history of Venezuela and Latin America, so that people will not forget sort of you know the historical context from which the country you know has has arrived from. And I think this is important in making, in the making, not of the, the Venezuela, but you know, Chavez used the term the Bolivarian. So now you're no longer the Venezuelan, you're the Bolivarian, 
right? Because you're you're in you're part of the Boulevard and Health Revolution. Right? And this is a, a new a new identity, a new national identity. This way, um, one is forced to look at nationalism. And I use um, Spike Peterson for the definition of nationalism. A particular and a particular and particular potent manifestation of political identification, which is a subset of political identity, can either be state like through assimilation of all within a state to the state's preferred cultural forms, which is what I see happening. What she continues all a state seeking that is knowledge, of identification, pursuit of recognition. As an independent state. But I see the first part of her, of her definition as, as relevant, as extremely relevant in this context. I'm not sure how much I, how I am with time, but I'll just move on. As such, genders will signify remains instrumental in the nation building discourse, especially in Venezuela, where women are the face of the revolution. And as he has said, there is no socialism without feminism and vice versa. My true socialism is feminist. Venezuelan women as a, a symbol of the new Boulevard Republic of Venezuela, which is the same. The nation as woman metaphor and nation state, and nation state creation. The nation as woman metaphor, it's, it's all over the, Venezuela is all over, you know, his, his rhetoric, his statements, for example. But I believe like in other usage, usings of the nation as woman metaphor, where the woman is considered sort of passive, I believe in this context, it is not, not as such. Where the woman is constructed as a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And um, what are my chapters do for this? I can't remember. But, uh, where I use his, his speeches, his direct speeches. Mm -hmm. And you know, he talks about a revolutionary woman, the patriot, the Bolivarian. And um, he sort of um, compares women to Manuel Sayans, who was considered a lover of Simon Bolivar. But she wasn't just his lover, she was actually um, a colonel in his army, and she saved him many times from being assassinated. So many so she's also considered the liberator of the liberator. Mm -hmm. So in his speeches, he sort of compares Venezuelan women now to Manuel Sayans. He wants Manuel Sayans you know, to be created. So they're no they're, they're not passive, this right? They're revolutionary, the Bolivarians, the patriots, they're defenders of the state. These are his two, is that um, um, This was also new to me, the concept of Kodia popular, or popular power, where, um, where um, in the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela, there are new, construction of, new constructions of power, which are different from you know, other countries. So, um, in December 2010, the National Assembly approved the Organic Law of Popular Power and Organic Law of Popular Public Planning. And these laws aim to transform the state structures of planning and decision making to involve more grassroots organizations. That's going to read through this. Popular, um, quote, and popular follows on the participatory and protagonistic democracy as it shines the country's constitution, where it aims to promote a strengthening of the organization of people in accordance with consolidating revolutionary protagonistic democracy and the creation of communal and community style government forms. So in this way, power is from the bottom up. And he gives a lot of power to the people themselves. A lot of um, power to people themselves and to people in the communities. So um, power is especially given to the consumer communalists, which um, he constructed upon his, his election so the Council of Communalities for the Community Councils. There are two perspectives, however, on um, the Poder, on Poder, popular, on Poder popular and their um, the impact on the Council of Communalities. So there's Marta Hanekel, and she is a close advisor to President Chavez, and she was sort of responsible for the development of the Council of Communalities. And she has stated, this is not 2016, she said, this is how solidarity begins, because you start to see that your problem is wider than your small reality, that you must help others. Thus, the community councils are more of a school for political formation 
I think popular call when it is really democratic is the best school because it produces the deliberative process. So I see two things there, right? So power is given to, to the community through these councils. But then these councils also sort of are a, she used the word school for the deliberative process. And it is a school sort of in, in educating members, you know, on the revolution, on the process. And it's sort of um, creating support and maintaining support to the process. However, there are those like Shireen in 2007 who doesn't see, who um, <clears throat> sort of criticizes this idea of bottom up power, especially given to the concern of coming out, is because for Shireen, he or she says, they, <laughs> Um, Shirino believes that the community council is kind of mobilized by themselves because you're always open to manipulation from the top. And I had a conversation with Professor Gilvan on this two days ago. And the thing is, I was only able to attend one um, concealed coming out, one meeting of a concealed, concealed coming out, which is concealed coming out, the checkout. And um, so I can't really talk or you know, give any perspective on how they operate and if the operation is sort of impacted by or manipulated by people on the top. I can't really speak to that. But these are the two perspectives. It's good, it's bad. As is most things in Venezuela. It's either, either against, you're for, it's good, it's bad. Clientalism versus interest. I spoke to I spoke to Pantalism in one of my chapters as well, but I think um, it warranted further um, investigation in my conclusion. And there are two perspectives with regard to Pantalism that I want to look into because if one is to look at look into the political process in Venezuela, because Latin America has a history of Pantalism and Pantalist policies. And what you do see there, if you look at it sort of straight on, you would think that the okay, plantism is alive and well stuff. So, you know, Shabbos is given to community, to persons, and you know, in, re in return, they're voting for him, he's remaining in power. Right? He's been in power for 12 years, and there's a referendum in which um, they struck down two limits. So he can run indefinitely, as long as he's alive and healthy. He could win uh, elections, he's president, and so so my two perspectives, thoughts, right? Well, this is a um, definition of plantivism. The exchange of political rights for social benefits. And Fox has, has this, um, described what he considers authoritarian plantivism, that is where the denial of political support for a politician can result in a threat to livelihood. But I know that we all, and this came out from my second seminar as well, where plantivism, as we know it, especially in the Caribbean, we sort of draw on the car stone and the, and the Jamaican context. And he says, personal loyalty individual political actors who have, he, he defines fantasy as such, sorry. Personal loyalty to individual political actors who have or are perceived to have a high capability to allocate and distribute divisible material and social benefits as well as invisible sectoral class or community <coughs> benefits. And I think if one is to look at the uh, Venezuelan context, context service by looking at, one would say yes. This is it, right? Yes, it's fantasism. Right? Also, the Villa and Kanash, they believe that supporting Chavez is a threat to democracy because, according to Hawkins 2010, right, it is Chavez's ability to use democratic ideals, right, sort of questions fundamental democratic practice because we must, we, we must remember, uh, many people consider Chavez an you know, authoritarian leader, but he was put in there through fair democratic means, right? And then there's Panko um, Becerra, who believes that Chavez's mission served two purposes. While distributing social funds directly to the poor and working class population, the mission also sits in manipulating votes of people like Chavez. So there's this perspective. And there's this perspective. Shola, 2011. Right? In looking at plantism and the client-patron relationship, Right? Schiller says that the client is portrayed as unsophisticated, passive, uncritical, as powerless to the powerful patron. And any, any agency of the client is stripped, of, is stripped away in this course around clientelism. So, in looking at other perspectives, there is no, there's sort of, 
and ignoring of agency. Two, Wagero. Wagero actually looks at clientelism and clientelist policies um, in Argentina, especially during the time of um, Peron. And Aguero says, the vital shortcoming of most of the literature is that it provides an inadequate explanation for the subjective dimension of capitalism. That is, insufficient attention is paid to the experiences, thoughts, and evaluations embodied in those objective relationships. In this way, the thoughts and evaluations of internal women who are benefiting materially from their support of Chavez must be considered. So, the main questions that come out of this and looking at capitalism, especially in that context, is is a process a transformative one. Chavez has created, he has created social, social missions. People, especially women, have benefited. But is it transforming their everyday lives? Is it, is it transformative? Or is it as one of the um, authors I just, um, I just read? Is it just a way of accumulating votes and keeping them at the state where they are, right? Does it, only seek, does it seek only to maintain the status quo? Are women empowered or do they remain in a state of dependency? And I think these are the main questions if one is to look at clientelism, especially in the events women context, because women are benefiting. There are material, tangible benefits. So is it fair to say it's clientelism or, or their clientelist policies? So in this way, I'm not sure if it's unresolved or, or not, but there's a plan to is it not. There are material benefits. You can see that. <laughs> there are benefits. Five Agency and empowerment. I wanted to go into this. I started this research project trying not to speak about empowerment because I think empowerment is sort of a, um, it's hard to define. And I remember even emailing Dr. Pia asking, like, can I do this without using empowerment? <laughs> I didn't want to use empowerment. But it's hard to go into any um, gender development project or look at any literature of meeting up with, 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 with you know, the concept of empowerment. I know I only have five minutes. But in, everyone speaks about empowerment. Right? It's part of the sort of state feminist discourse, you know. And um, I'll just. <coughs> the definitions that I, I would use. Um, drawing heavily on Dr. Papert and her, you know, her friends. They, they write a lot about um, It's always Papert and XYZ Papert and XYZ and Papert. So Professor Papert, also Kabir, who talks about what it means to be disempowered. So this in class will give us the definition of empowerment. So I'm thinking about, what I'm thinking, I, in looking at empowerment and agency in the Venezuelan context, I would, I believe that um, empowerment there yeah, can be seen through looking at choice and voice, right? <clears throat> empowerment is women's ability to make choices and to speak their minds. The search for empowerment has thus become a search for women's voices, particularly the moment when women demonstrate age they're speaking out against patriarchal authority. <clears throat> and while, um, the Cabrera quote, you know, to me that's that's the you know the idea when it comes to choice and voice. What I see choice and voice being in the Venezuelan context is, <clears throat> for example, Chavez Chavez giving the people, especially women, the power to vote, for example, in referendums. So many of the people, especially women, were able to have a voice in shaping their constitution. It wasn't something that was done in the parliament of the lower house and then you know, ten of us vote and that's it. The people actually put in a random, and especially this constitution, which um, there were many policies which totally impacted the lives of women. Women had a voice, right, to make a choice, you know, what would be the constitution. However, I know there are many critics of this choice voice empowerment sort of concept, because there are many, um, for example, Kandi T and even Mohammed, who believe that there could be empowerment in silence. And I will um, look into that as well as I finish my conclusion. Also, empowerment in, um, as capabilities from 2001. And my, my original theoretical framework, I do draw a lot on NASCAR, right, and the idea of capabilities. 
those basic constitutional principles that should be respected and implemented by the governments of all nations as a bare minimum of what respect for human dignity requires. And Chavez especially, he buys into this idea of capabilities, by expanding people's capabilities, especially women's capabilities. I'm just going to jump ahead because I'm going to take time. <coughs> there are also other people, um, they like numbers and statistics and hard data. So, you know, I could, these um, indices could be used to measure empowerment. But I also believe, um, I agree with Nella Kavir in 1999, that you can, and this, and this is my problem with empowerment, the idea of measuring empowerment. So in this way, I believe, you know, I, I agree with Kavira in 1999. But I think it's worthwhile to look at these indices, especially indices by UN women, which has stated that, you know, Chavez is doing well with regard to women. <laughs> I have some documents from UN women. Everything looks great. Everything is perfect and nice. We get to look at um, some of the options. Um, the Council of Governmentality, my first research. <laughs> My first recent seminar, Professor Papa was very vocal in looking at, at governmentality, which is the conduct of conduct. Governmentality is the attempt to shape human conduct by cognitive means. Its purpose is to secure the welfare of the population, the improvement of its condition, the increase of its wealth, longevity, health, well being. Governments thus do this by educating desires and confirming habits, aspirations, and beliefs. So it brings you back to sort of a, const you know, a construction of bodies, national identity of nation, right? And I see this book, the Bolivarian Process and the Revolution, as, as a construction, a construction of a nation, of a process, right? Of, you know, Chavez has his goals, his aims, you know, will we see the, you know, the end product? Not sure. <laughs> the time is running out. So thank you so much for your time. Sorry for watching. Thank you. Do you, uh, do you have anything to sum up or? I, I could stop there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Leah, again, another very thought provoking seminar. We'll go to Professor Hogan first, then to Dr. Pierre, and then Professor Hogan. Yes. Well, uh, can I interject quickly? I can't. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very loud. Okay. Um, Try to speak into, I don't know where the microphone is, yes, because I can't hear anyone right now. <coughs> okay, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. Um, yeah, the problem with speaking first is <laughs> there's so much on the table. Um, Try to organize some reasonably coherent comments on it, I would say. First of all, that um, earlier you have flagged a number of issues which have arisen as a result of actually conducting this research, some of which um, were not issues that you expected to encounter in going into it, or are not issues which you actually constructed a methodology to find the answers for. Um, for example, the question of popular power, popular popular, and the question of um, uh, nation state and nationalism. I think perhaps empowerment was there, um, but even the issues of the the the, the, um, the varieties of feminism, and especially the two um, apparently antagonistic versions of feminism. So I guess the first um, first general reaction is that perhaps you need to think about the way in which you can crystallize or sharpen the issues which have come out without putting yourself under the pressure of the expectation that you have to resolve those issues or you have to use the research that you did to resolve those issues because clearly at least some of them emerge as a consequence of the process and of, of actually doing. And perhaps if you were to start all over again, you might construct different questions and different methodology which um, are designed to help you answer those questions. So that's a general a general uh, comment. 
second general comment is that I have the impression that you're still extremely close to the material. In a sense, you are overwhelmed by a large number of, you know, um, things, if you like, sensory experiences, some of which are cerebral as a consequence of doing the actual um, research, and, and some of which are impressionistic as, as, as a consequence of actually living within the process. And some, of, and some of them actually come out as a, as a result of, the, of the, um, the questions that you administer, whereas some come out as a result of engagement with the literature. So a lot of things are evidently going around in your head. And uh, maybe um, you need to find a way to perhaps distance yourself, perhaps detach yourself from the digest of simulators that there's that part of the whole um, dissertation writing process, which is that you know, you know you have all the ingredients which are cooking it and you're assimilating it and you're just trying to digest and make sense of it. And it's really a conversation with yourself, really material. So um, there's that general impression as well. Now, with respect to the some of the concrete issues that you that you um, flag, I especially like the, um, or I'm interested in the way in which the question of new feminisms came up, and especially the, 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 the sharp um, contrast between the feminism in which holds that patriarchy is the main enemy and the feminism in which holds that capitalism is the main enemy. I mean, in one case, one is about one is subordinate to, to the other, and the other is it's a bit, a bit reserved, uh, reversed. I'm not so sure about the distinction of a third category in which feminism is based on making needs, because it seems to me that both the two, if you like, dominant versions are about how those met needs, those needs. Uh, women's needs are to be met, and if you like, um, this idea that ideology is somehow divorced from the world of practice and policy, I think one needs to think about that a little more, because it's not as if, not as if you have a cerebral or intellectual notion over there, and a, a practical notion of practice and policy over there. There's an organic linkage between the two, so I think about whether that distinction is really um, uh, not an, an artificial um, one. Um, I've said this to you before, and I'll just say it again for the record. I, I don't really follow the debate about bodies and power. I don't know if it is because I'm unfamiliar with the literature or the way in which it is, um, it is formulated, but I, 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 I don't know how a docile body can be an empowered body. And I don't understand um, what your side means in the Foucauldian sense. So, uh, but, I, but this is maybe because you simply didn't explain it sufficiently well, or I'm not familiar with the, um, with, with, with the literature. But I think if you are going to engage that issue, then either you engage it you know, adequately or, or not at all, because right now to be it is a good time. Is Confusing. On the question of nation state and national identity, that's a very interesting and you say came out of the research. I wanted to say, however, that you said something in the paper to the effect that the Venezuelan revolutionary process or socialist process was the first one in which a national or nationalist or a national character has been infused. I don't think that's so at all. In fact, I would argue that all the great popular socialist revolutions have been as much national as they are socialist. Cuban Revolution, evidently, Marti is as important as Marx, perhaps even more important than Marx um, in defining the character. And similarly with the Chinese Revolution, Mao, Mao Zedong. 
so you have yes. the same mood. And so you might be you inside know, so you have a Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and um, Lenin and then Stalin you know, in the case of the Russian Revolution. So it's a, it's a question. Now, the success with which Chavez has appropriated the Bolivarian legacy is, I think, um, of, of uh, very great interest. And I would argue that there is a psychological dimension about um, that appropriation as well as the other ones, you know, the past I mentioned, which has to do with the validation of self or the validation of the collective self in a context where um, national characteristics have been uh, denigrated by the previous um, period of, of uh, external domination, so that the nationalist in, in a sense is a form of, 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 of validation. Now the question of, of women and the role of Manuel Saez um, as the liberator of the liberator. Now that's very interesting because I think there's a very interesting paradox or contradiction there. Now obviously this happened 200 years ago. And the relationship between Manuel Science and uh, Simon Bolivar could not escape the structures and the culture of the time in which um, women were care, you know, caregivers of, of, of men, protectors. Women had, if you like, a, a subordinated service role um, to men. Now, and this is what she, she saved his life several times. But she was a revolutionary, or and she was a revolutionary. So the question is, is it and she was a revolutionary, or but she was a revolutionary? Was, does, in the Chavezian definition, is her revolutionary and liberating role defined exclusively in function? Of her, of her role in saving the liberator, or is she ascribed a, a an independent revolutionary role? Did she bear arms? Did she, you know, shoot people? Did she, you know, was she a, you like a, uh, an equally valid revolutionary fighter, or was it only relation? To so that's interesting because if um, it is just in terms of her caregiving role. To Chavez, one could argue that all this is doing is reproducing a traditional sense of the role of the woman. So this, I think, may be something which could, which could be uh, which could be explored um, quickly because I'm taking up a lot of time. And the question of clientelism, um, yes, I think those three questions are are critical questions. Now, transformative is it part of a transformative? The reason why I think in terms of Stone's version of clientelism. People continue to be dependent on the politician for the benefits of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a repro it's, it's reproduced from election to election. Things don't really change, but the politician delivers certain benefits in exchange for votes. The transformative question here is, to me, interesting. Is, is, is it part of a process which in its macro dimension is transformative of, of existing um, structures of power as well as in the, okay, as, as well as in the micro in, in the in the um, micro level. And finally with respect, with respect to empowerment, um, which I think yes you didn't want to deal with it, but obviously you have to deal with it and I would suggest a couple of dimensions to think of. One is that empowerment begins in the mind. It has to do with self-confidence, with which people act, speak out, and believe that they can act in their own interests. And obviously that's, you know, one of our terms can free our mind to it starts, that's where it starts. Second, then there's an aspect of capabilities, education, literacy, skills, and such uh, um, ability, if you like, to realize one's potential and if you like ability to exercise the subjective power that one needs. Then another dimension is the impact of the individual or the group on decision making, the decision making structures at different levels of the society. And that is something which can be measured at least to some degree. And then a fourth aspect which is related to the third 
has to do with control of resources. So in this case, do you then control credit? Do they control um, land? Do they control you know, material resources, which I need? So those are some. Can you want me to go next? Yes. Next up. Okay. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Very good. Okay, great. Okay, um, I have questions and comments. But first of all, um, uh, Alia, I don't know which version we received of your paper, but the one that I have, which is the conclusion, doesn't have a section on agency and empowerment. Yes. And also, there's an entire section that is actually quite important that you left out completely from the presentation. So I'll get to that in a minute. I think it was quite important, and I don't know why it wasn't in the presentation. Okay, so, um, well, thank you, um, Alia. Um, I'm actually glad that um, you decided to give a presentation of your concluding chapter because it kind of signals to us that you're very close to finishing. Um, I think you did an excellent, excellent job here to reflect upon some of the issues that were brought up at the last research seminar. And um, I think it was actually important for you to provide us with some stories from the field, which you did in the paper. And, uh, you know, in, in, in a way, you gave us a sense and a feel of your visit to Venezuela, and I think you did a really good job integrating your field work and visit into this concluding chapter, which is really important. Um, so I, I really enjoyed reading your own observations and reflections, and I think you provided us with a good summary of the main issues while still raising some really key and compelling points, some of which actually warrant a bit more discussion or at least um, commentary. So I made some notes of that, um, unless, of course, you covered some of those issues in previous chapters. Now, um, be before I get to my questions, um, the other thing you need to do in the conclusion, okay, is to bring back the objective of your dissertation, women and the Bolivarian state. It's, it's missing, okay? Are they winning or are they losing ground? You have to say something, right? And also, you need to connect the main gist of your study to some of the more salient points you bring up in your conclusion. Okay, so I, I think you, you did a wonderful job bringing together elements or main points from previous chapters, such as clientelism, to inform some of the reflections and analysis in this concluding chapter. Okay, so some, some comments there. Now, there's a specific question I had on page four and five, and I, it's a figure, and I just wanted you to, to, to clarify this. You said that the number of women who support President Chavez has varied from 98,000 to 200,000. Yeah, okay, and I, I think you need to explain this briefly because this is a country of some 29 million people with 6 million people in Caracas, and I think the figure you cite is somewhat small. Okay, so I was just had a query on that. Um, generally, on the new on the issue of new feminism, and I kind of agree with Norman here. Um, similar comments. Uh, you have a good discussion, a good beginning discussion. I think it's still a draft in that section. We see here some very inter interesting tensions between the two feminisms. Um, there really needs to be a little bit more elaboration on opposition feminism. But your assertion for this other kind of feminism based on met needs, I think you need to make a clearer and more compelling distinction between this and popular or state feminism which has essentially ensured that women's needs are met. And I think this is the point that Norma kind of had raised. Um, so you need to clarify that, okay, if you're going to assert this or make this assertion. Uh, the section on bodies and power, I'm also with two minds with this section, like what Norman had said. Um, actually, I think you did a really good job discussing Foucault here. But again, I would connect this or link it back up to your thesis, if it's relevant, that, in other words, link it back up to women and the Bolivarian state, um, you know, in this section, whenever I see the word Bolivarian next to body, I, the word ovarian always comes into my head, right? Um, anyway, so, you know, would, would Chavez's empowered but docile female body then be an argument that women in Venezuela have indeed one ground in regard to their health and physical well-being, right? So you need to state it, okay, if you're going to keep it. Okay, um, and also whether it justifies the amendment of Venezuela constitution in keeping Chavez in power indefinitely. So it's just something I, I it came to mind. Also, I was wondering, in regard to your mention of the high number of breast augmentation surgeries in Venezuela, what connection does this have to the fact that Venezuela prides itself for its beauty pageants 
right? Venezuela probably holds the world record for the most wins in international beauty pageants, having received what? Six Miss World titles, six Miss Universe titles, six Miss International titles, and even a Miss Earth title. And whether this important element, right, of national pride has any bearing on women generally in Venezuela and under Chavez, right? So if anything, it would really make an interesting footnote. I don't think you can avoid it. If you're going to keep the section on bodies and power, you have to mention Venezuela and its beauty pageant. Yeah? Um, okay. The section on na nation, state, and national identity, I think it's actually a very good section. Uh, on page 18, with regard to the embodiment of the nation and as women and mothers, right? What would you say would be the response of the statement on part of the women you met and spoke to in terms of their understanding of feminism defined through their needs as women and mothers? And I think at the end of this section, you pose a really important question. Okay? Um, I'm almost done. Uh, just two more points. Um, the, the section you left out for your presentation, the section on Caracas, yeah? I really like your incorporation of field work into this section. I was just wondering why you chose not to use the term state propaganda anywhere. Okay? Also important to note in this section is the rule of urban disparity, which is really interesting. I, I found it really interesting, right? And I wonder if this urban rule disparity is deliberate on part of Chavez, right? If, if, if it is that Chavez only wants to ensure that his PR reaches only the most populous areas. And also, how your interactions with people in Merida, whose lives have not changed, right, feed into this discussion earlier about the construction of women's new political identities, about Chavez and about the revolution, which do not seem to resonate in certain sites or communities in Venezuela. You have to say something there. It's, it's missing component. That's a question I have for you. And lastly, okay, your concluding paragraph needs to include your commentary and analysis on Chavez and power, okay? So bring it back to your point on women and the revolution. In other words, you need to reiterate your main thesis and you need to, you, you do need to pose here in the concluding section questions for future research or implications for future research on women and the political process or the relationship between women and the state. Okay, so those are some of my comments and, and questions for you. Just one, one quick comment. I'm here laughing here because I told Ali um, when I read the chapter that you know, it was too much like a tra travelogue and you know where you want to focus on the <laughs> theoretical issues. You don't want to tell people what you saw at the airport run right, right away from the airport or in Caracas. It's two totally different <coughs> sets of advice you get in here. But I, 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 I um, I see, you know, clearly, that's a bit Okay. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I will just complicate things. Rhoda, just check that Pia can hear you. I say I'll probably just complicate things further, but I do agree with some of the things that you said. Bye, Pia. Pia, can you hear me? Yes, what I can. I, yeah, I agree with I some of the things that Pia says, some of the things that Mom said, but I also want some other things. First of all, as I said before, this is an area that is very interesting and um, it has a lot of potential. But Ali, I think that there's still a lot of work to do to really bring it out in its voice. I think, for example, that I don't think it's such a good idea to raise so many heavy new theoretical notions in the conclusion. In other words, I think that the study would be enhanced if some of this could be integrated into the earlier sections. For example, like some of these concepts could be reintegrated into the theoretical and conceptual framework. Because remember, your thesis is when you're finished, it's finished. It's supposed to be the entirety of what you have learned. So you don't want at the end to say, you know, I didn't notice when I wrote chapter two, but now I know when I write chapter seven. So I think that 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 you now have an opportunity to re to go back to some of what you did before and to see how some of this new understanding could be integrated. I also agree with Norman that some detachment 
would be good standing outside, but I know that also that's not good to do. I think that um, that I also want to support Pia's point, but I want to go even further. <coughs> to me, the conclusion should really be bringing together and consolidating what went on in the thesis. So I would actually suggest that you begin this section by returning to the original objectives and research questions. Why did I do this study? And what were my questions? What was I trying to do? I think you remind the reader at the end, OK, this is where we started. Then what I would suggest is that after that, you then trace the development of your argument with drawing on the conclusions of each one of your chapters. So then the conclusion begins to, you know, the reader can actually see. The, what happens here is that you have all these issues. But you're not seeing how one argument leads into the other, how they develop over the course of the entire thesis. So that if you don't have good conclusions, I think conclusions to each chapter are very useful. Say, OK, what we, And then in the summary now, you bring together all of the conclusions, seeing how they link together and how they build up to your answer of these original objectives. Next. I would, after I've done this, in doing this, I would discuss the extent to which you were able to meet the objectives or to answer the research questions. The extent to which the questions changed, the extent to which your objectives changed, the extent to which your whole project may have got railroaded in another direction. But again, the reader can see the process in which your ideas are developing and why. Then, I think um, you can then, in raising all these things, all the issues, so by then, all your main findings would be coming out in a nice order. But then at the end, as Pia said, you can end with those unanswered questions. Those things that you still, still are, you don't understand, things that maybe somebody else can look at and food for thought. So I would certainly reorganize and, um, and, and restructure the way in which this is, but also see how some of these insights could enrich and also help to organize what you have done before. Now, the other thing is um, I want to look at the whole question of new feminisms. Because I think that, that you, since this thesis, in this thesis, feminism and socialism are such key concepts that maybe a deeper reading of the literature on feminism and socialism would be useful. Because when I hear this, this takes me back to the 80s. Maybe it's because I'm older and you are young. So they are new to you, but these are, some of these are very old questions. In fact, let me use my other glasses. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, um, what what? Let me see what I see. Right. Okay. So, so Norman has already made the point that all the socialist revolutions try to localize it. You know, Ho Chi Minh, you know, Lenin, Mao Zedong, Jose Martin, etc. So the use of Bolivar very much feeds it. So, in other words. We are not importing a regular revolution. This is our local revolution. And that has always been important, especially in rejecting what we've seen as the Soviet domination. So I think that's so important. Similarly, I agree with Norman again that none, no socialism was ever based on ideology alone. In fact, if we look at all the socialist revolutions, what was good about them was the, this, this focus on health needs which was why Molina needed to develop her thing, to say, OK, these revolutions give women things, but do they really transform patriarchal relations? So that all the socialist revolutions have tried to deal with women's health needs, including, as I mentioned, the Cubans who actually gave women pressure cookers, you know, daycare centers. It's just all the socialist revolutions have sought to do that. It's a transformation of patriarchy and also the real 
in a way, democratic empowerment were some of the challenges. So Cuba, Grenada, they all did these things of trying to deal with the lower, the working classes, trying to give women their fed. That was one of the characteristics of all the revolutions. So I think we need to look at what was different about the Chavez Revolution. And I would say what is different from the Chavez Revolution would be trying to organize socialism in a free market economy. And that is where your McDonald's and all of these, and, and TGI Fridays, that is what has come in and that is a very interesting development because all the others in Cuba, they try to transform the economic base, you know, they privatize, you know, so the whole question of organizing, trying to have socialism within a free market, a globalized free market economy. What was also different about the Chavez revolution was the state adoption of the term feminist. Because even though the woman question, and I think I stressed that last time, has been critical to all the socialist discourses, going back to, to um, Robert Owen in the utopian socialism, coming right down to the Marxist socialism, coming right down even to social democracy, as in Norway, Sweden, and those countries. The attention to women has been central to all the entire socialist tradition. But the challenge to patriarchy was not there. And this is because many socialist revolutions are led by a powerful male leader, El, Machi, El Machista Chisto Numero Uno. And that is why the, the, the adoption of the word feminist by the state, that is a definitely something different of the Bolivarian revolution. But there has been a strong acceptance among the, the coin, no socialism with a, I used to wear that as a button in the 80s, that was the socialist feminist slogan, that you cannot have socialism without feminism. So that is a very old socialist idea. But it was never adopted by states. And that is one of the differences, of course, from my reading of what you have put. I think one of the other differences of this Chavista revolution is the favorable economic context that allows for major state transfers. I mean, you had Cuba dependent on the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union, and that was it. That's, that is the end of Cuba. So, the, so many of these societies, and that is why in some countries like China, they have to have such extreme repression to accumulate in order to do that redistribution. So I think the favorable economic context, the oil economy, as I Chavez to put his thumbs up to the US and all those places. So I think that 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 a deeper reading would would really help you to really identify what is the true difference between the Shavista revolution and other socialist revolutions that we have had, even within the Latin American and Caribbean region. My next term has to do with socialism and what does it mean? And I'm sorry I didn't see your earlier definitions. But state socialism has, has often become associated with nationalization and state transfers. But my understanding of socialism in its deepest sense has to do with the restructuring of the economic base of the society, which is what Norman raised. And, I'm, and in fact, this has been one of the weaknesses of the, in other words, so what I'm, power went from a capitalist class into a state owning class, which was also open to the same kind of um, corruption, etc. But there have been other socialist traditions that have tried to, to address this, for example, through cooperative organization, workers' ownerships of production, forms of collective decision making. What you mentioned, I remember in Grenada, Grenada is supposed that the budget, to do the budget, they used to go to every community and sit down and discuss with people what should be in the budget. So there have been, so in other words, what in terms of the economy, is it just that the part, how has this, so a big part aspect of socialism is this restructuring of the economy. And I would like to see what in the Chavista revolution has really tried to tackle 
alternative, some sort of alternative yeah. form of ownership. Now, I know that he would not be so stupid as the two to be, because socialism in one country is also a problem. Yeah. But has he given any symbolic attention to this other, in other words, you can't just continue with transfers. That is where you are populist. Where can people be economic, there be transformation, so that people have some ownership and control of these resources in a way that they, they, they benefit. And I know that my time is going, but I just want to say that, um, that I like the notion of bodies, but I would like to see it more integrated into the thesis you know, and into your conceptual theory. In fact, I would want you to rethink your conceptual theory to <coughs> incorporate many more of these kinds of the clientelism, the governmentality, the bodies, all of those things. And I see governmentality and bodies closely together, but that because in other words, the governmentality structures and organizes the space and the systems, etc., within which bodies have to operate. And in terms of the woman, that is that has always been fun. I mean, no one will remember the famous poster of Patsy Lewis in her school uniform in Grenada holding a gun. That was the iconic I AK for that was the iconic symbol of the Grenada Revolution. And almost every revolution has a picture of a woman with a gun. Because the revolution so the notion of what women can do in revolutionary times, what you say, but which they cannot do outside of revolutionary times, would be important in relation to your question. So I think that what I'm saying is this is rich. There's a lot that could be done. But there needs to be a bit more order and structure and a deeper grounding in the understandings of socialist feminism. I'm glad this is all being recorded because there's so much that yeah. uh, it'll be available to I'll be able to send that both of them to you. As all long right. as you have Gmail. Aliyah, mm -hmm. thank you. So nobody else has any. Oh yeah, no, we're going oh, to the okay. yes, I just wanted to make sure all of that Aliyah got all the comments from her advisor. Aliyah, I just have a few for you. And Deborah. I'm coming to you because I'm almost in exactly the same position as you are because I'm defending in a few weeks. And so I'm coming from a, a very practical position. One is, I'm not sure you have, you have read your dissertation from beginning to end. And I was not able to see the big picture until that very practical um, process of reading your dissertation from beginning to end. And I think this is what Professor Radoff is getting at in terms of your conclusion. Because you haven't seen the big pictures yet, you are raising issues in your conclusion that should have been addressed previously. So you really need to do that. In 2000, February 2011, I did a complete draft of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Then I disaggregated it, and I hadn't put it back together until a couple of years ago. So I kept writing in spurts. And it's all in my mind, but my committee wasn't actually seen. They get in sections and they're sending it back. And my chair finally said to me, when last have you read your dissertation from beginning to end? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, okay. <laughs> so you have that very practical thing to do. And until you do that, I don't think you can get to the conclusion and go back to revisit the introduction to make sure you have everything in between. So I don't know if that is That's me. Really okay. So that is useful. I think then you would realize that you also have this practical thing. I, I read an article not too long ago called Disappearing Acts by Nicole Alexander Floyd. And she talked about the fact that intersectionality, how it's being used now, has disappeared women from the discourse on women. And it seemed like you have disappeared your subjects. Now, when you did your first research seminar, you talked about you remember those women who were kind of the swing vote. So in coming to your conclusion, I was expecting to see that reworking and how women were actually, and it seems as though they are no longer subjects in your, in your dissertation. So I think and all of your advisors have spoken to the fact that you need to make that connection again to the question you're raising about women in the state, and they seem to have been disappeared from, from the state. 
In terms of empowerment, you had said that you were struggling, this has been covered, you were struggling with it, but you did an entire section on docile bodies and empowered bodies. So I'm not sure how you are reconciled and not wanting to deal with empowerment, but, and again, we do need um, that definition, you know, the Foucaultian definition of docility and empowerment. So I want to see you move through that. Uh, again, we talked about the feminisms. That, because you dealt with the feminisms, you dealt with the construction of nation, and you dealt with client, um, is a client in this country. Right, client this. But we were not seeing, again, how they are connected. So they seem as though they are very separate sections, and there is no conversation taking place among these different, whether they're theoretical frameworks. So I would like to see that. And again, I'm talking from being in the same position you are in putting these things together. But you really do need to just, wherever you are now, don't write anything else, just read from the beginning to end. So you get a sense of everything you have and where you're going from that particular position. So I think um, Professor is right in the terms that, oh, going back to what Professor Gilvin said to in terms of where you're located now and the passion and emotional attachment you have. I have been out of the field now for maybe a year and something. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have the critical distance you do. One of the critiques I kept getting, well, again from the committee, um, two of one an anthropologist loved the subjective position, my subjective position, my interaction with my uh, committee, with my subjects. And they were getting the my drafts before it went to the rest of the committee. Or for some of them, it was ready for publication. When my third reader came, it was like, hey, today I don't like this, too much editorializing. So I had to find a way to position where is my voice coming in and where can it be useful. So I created another chapter called Autobiography mm -hmm. and Ethnography. And I took the personal encounters and I positioned it there. But also had the theory, and it was my concluding chapter as well. So I was able to say, this is where I came in. This is what I've come to realize, and these are my subjects of position. So that was a way I was able to keep my personal voice, because I thought it was important that my voice be there in communication. Uh, when they had the march, for example, this is the Muslim name on the Ministry of Education, it was important that I was able to participate in certain events or not, because it was important in my mission and my objective to humanize the Muslim name position in a particular way. So I didn't want to totally relinquish it. So that is how I came to reconcile that particular cycle. No, I just wanted to respond to this because I didn't get a chance to say it. I just wanted to say that I too, I think, I too believe that you, your voice should be there. But I'm wondering maybe if in your methodology section, which I haven't seen, because it was a kind of ethnographic, I think that reflexivity is very important in feminist theorizing. Mm -hmm. And if in your method, you can, in your reflexivity in your writing, in that section, I think you can bring it in there and at other points in pieces. But just at the end of conclusion, I felt that it could be there, but not in exactly the same way. But I do take the point that I think your voice could be there and your own reflexivity. Oh yes, a few other things. In terms of when you were cited in the office by like Uber, Davis and Amphias, as well as Parpert, I wasn't sure that you represented them accurately. So you gave the definitions, but you didn't give the context. Yes. Parpert, for example, argues vehemently against the privilege of voice, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. But the way you cited it, it seems as though that Parpert and Kabir almost agreed. I mean, there's this whole this course between them where exactly where they were quarreling. <laughs> so I guess you again the Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yes, even with Yuba Davis and the construction of the nation, they can say that this is how we disconstructed, but then they critique that. Yeah. And that didn't come through in your use of, of the uh, of site and their I think that's basically I just one last thing. Yes. When I mentioned the um the state feminism. I think what is useful, maybe a language you may wish to consider, is how the concept of feminism is deployed 
within the context of Venezuela. You know, because because I think that that is a, a very specific deployment of the concept. Because if you say those opposition feminism women, they that is how they call themselves. I think that is how it is used in that particular context. So I think seeing it as a specific historical or or whatever deployment of the two would allow us to, to understand them in that context and know that it may not be that same usage usage may not be relevant in another context. Anyone? Oh, I just want to. I will share the article with you. Uh, the one that I just came to about two concepts you may want to look at. The idea that subjects can be looked at from an ideational perspective and an ideological. And the ideational speaks more specifically to the subjects themselves and what they do. And the ideologic is the patchwork phrase where everything is just through them. And I think this is probably what you need to unpack in when I prompt uh, asking you, it, when they're asking you to define like socialism, for example. So there would be how it's how it works ideologically, but then specifically with these women in the group vibrancy, how does the idea of socialism um, help them construct and reconstruct their lives as opposed to the ideology of socialism? I know you had to hold Jose Martin. No, I just don't, but um, But one, hi, Dr. Van Sapa, um, that Ronnie heard me. I just had one. When, when, I, when I, um, I listened to you, uh, Jane is right. This one very early, I wrote if they did look at Mr. Martin um, in terms of um, his contribution to this thinking of um, socialism. But I, I listened to you talk about the jump off from um, Lenin, Trotsky, um, these thinkers into um, Chavez's um, Bolivarian. Um, faith. And I see, what I see too is um, Chavez also positioned himself very closely to um, Cuba and um, Castro. And when you speak to what you saw in Venezuela in terms of the, the, um, the bombardment of the woman and the presence of it is a similar practice in Cuba. So I, I, what I wrote down actually was there's a, a, a language um, around Trotsky and, 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 and what's it not, but there's also a practice of the Cuban revolution that I see um, in some of your work when you talk about the communal, communalists and, and those, those, um, those things. So I, I would, when, I think that's why I wrote Jose Martin. Um, because um, I think you need to look at, I don't know if you, I don't know, I don't know any paper, yeah. but I don't know if you want to look to at the ways in which the, not only the way the revolution happened, but the way in which the human revolution was reinvented itself. Mm -hmm. and, and as you look towards um, this 21st century um, socialism and, and this definition that, that you, you're looking towards, I think it's important that you do a um, as to borrow Professor Reddock's reading, a close reading of it, because there are really distinct um, similarities that you yeah, need like to the the communal work. councils. All those, all those like things. the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. The issues yeah. around bringing health care yeah. yeah. close to people. Yes. You know, all those things you yes. need yes. to look at. And, and, and that, the, the speak to what you saw driving into to, to Venezuela. It's a similar experience in terms of you see Patrio and all the yes, things yes, in Cuba. Yes, yes, yes. So you know those are those are issues around the the ideology and the the um, how you ensure that people own the revolution building that nation state. I don't know, but maybe you would like to yeah, because to be on yeah, I think it's very interesting. But I see that as kind of a missing block mm -hmm. um, in terms of She has a oh, hi, Deborah. My microphone is off. No, no, I, I actually support the comments that have been made, especially uh, Rhoda. 
um, all the points that you had raised to Alia with regard to um, tightening up the conclusion and actually feeding back into the point of the thesis, which has to be reiterated, and also to revisit all the other chapters again and, and make a more forceful, uh, you know, concluding kind of statement with regard to the, um, uh, your, your study. So um, I support all those points. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah, please smile. You're looking so serious. <laughs> She got a chance. She's supposed to respond. Yeah, she can respond. Let's give her the young opportunity. Yeah. Oh boy, I got the Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry. The mic. Thank you to everyone for their comments. Can you hear me, Dr. Pia? Dr. Pia? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thanks to everyone for their comments. Um, just to answer um, some of the questions that came up, um, <clears throat> I guess um, the question of detaching myself, mm -hmm. detaching. I think that is that is important because I only come to conclude my feet in November, which is quite quite recent. Mm -hmm. This is the last trip I made, and um, I do plan to go back there. Right? See what's happening. So, I'm not sure how detachment. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see what's well, happening. It's the best time to go. <laughs> so, the idea of detachment, I'm not sure how how much I could do. Right? right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right now, I'm not sure how much I could do. Right you guys say yes. I wouldn't, but I don't know. It's but not as much, yeah. Not as much, yes. I have all time. You see, the thing is, when you reach the end of the thesis, and then you're speaking about driving in, that would be the start. You know, but anyway, we'll see. Um, yeah, so these, these um, I guess, memories, uh, they're fresh. I remember, I remember everything. So, um, but I guess as I can do attachments, I get it. Um, with regard to the question of manual science and the construction of women as such, because we need to ask um, a woman, who did something, so that the protector and the revolutionary, or the protector but the revolutionary. And I think the Chavez, it's, it's both. It's and. And um, I have, a, there's a section in one of my chapters which sort of compares the relationship between manual science and Bolivar with the relationship between women supporters the Maria Roa and Chavez, sort of this um, this love, sort of like protect and revolutionary, you know, you know and I, I spoke about, you know, why women love Chavez, I think I spoke about that in my last seminar. So within that chapter, the previous chapter, there is sort of, I'm sort, of, sort of like looking at that relationship. So women are constructed as a protector and the revolutionary. To Chavez, it's the same. And Chavez has also stated at Boulevard, he claims Boulevard was a feminist. My research has shown. <laughs> so, so I'm constructing myself as well as I So, um, just to go through. Um, the, uh, you know, bringing back the objective, Dr. Pierre spoke about that. Yes. And this goes back to um, Gianna's comment about, about reading the whole dissertation. I haven't. So that is something I need to do in full. Which I, I do plan to do. I mean, I, I have to do it. But so, you know, sort of like stopping for a minute and reading through the um, whole thing. I think this chapter, too, um, a lot of you guys have said that I should incorporate every stuff that's in this chapter in the dissertation, but I have. These are the things that I've, I've written about in this chapter, are things that I have written about in my chapters, and things that I have discussed. But the reason that they are, they are Com, you know, sort of like concluding remarks and, and sort of like looking at them in a theoretical perspective is that originally, when I did my theoretical framework, I did not, my mind didn't go there. These are things that I sort of came upon during my fieldwork and I have written, you know, about. And I, I have discussed it in the chapters. But somehow I feel that they need sort of a, a rewriting again, you know, especially theoretically. 
I'm not sure if that's good or not. <laughs> you guys disagree on that. But this is why this chapter is is framed as it is. So by the way, we hear it all about considerations. Um, Dr. Peter, you um, you said well, I haven't used the word state propaganda. It never occurred to me to use that to use that that term state propaganda. I think it's sort of um, I don't know. So sort of, I don't know if I want to use that, <laughs> but I'll, I'll think about it because I guess for some it might look like state propaganda. <laughs> you know what what is happening there. But then I think like I'm sort of arguing for a, like a rereading or alternate alternative readings of you know like plantalism, populism. You know, so that is why you know I haven't used even like using the word rhetoric. Like I'm afraid to say it sometimes. You know. In that you don't have to be judgmental. Yeah, and I think I think yeah, like, just that, that just analytical. Okay. Um, I agree, Professor Rado. Okay, you know, a return to original objectives, which I have. You know, I need to go reread the original objectives, and I, as, as you guys said, I need to go back and read. Um, and I think that is it. Really, you know, thank you guys so much for your comments, and I think um, a lot of things do need a deeper reading. But I really want to keep it in this sort of format where I use my reflections and I sort of um, combine them with these quote unquote new theoretical considerations. Which as I said, I did write about, I have looked at in the chapters, but I think they need a new sort of looking at. Could I just make a comment here because a lot was said eh, that is of great value and I just wonder, I mean my advice to Alia would be to listen again one more time completely, not because she has notes, but she really needs to hear what was said again perhaps two or three more times, yeah, because there was a lot which I think... Uh, yeah, you listen to the other one? Yeah. I, I, I can send it to you, Norman, but I didn't have your gene. No, I don't need it. She's the oh, one. Okay. <laughs> they also distributed um, a lot of literature distributed. It's not going to be because they're not taking it away. It's not going to be because they're not taking it away. So, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. All right.